To turn now to our speaker, Mariette Leong, grew up in Adelaide in South of Australia. Her parents were Madge and Collis Featherstone. Of course, he's the hand of the cause of God that she'll be speaking about today. And she has three sisters and a brother. Um, in 1968, she and her older sister headed to uh, India by way of Malaysia to go to the first Southeast Asian Regional Youth Conference, where they ended up meeting their respective husbands. And we've had a delightful time talking to Mariette's husband, uh, while we aren't live here. So that's been quite, quite nice. Uh, she and her husband then pioneered to uh, Papua New Guinea in 1974, and she served on the National Spiritual Assembly there, including a period of time as its secretary. Since then, she has worked part-time in different jobs, developing a secretarial course and presenting it at business, uh, business Training Institute. And currently she is busy teaching piano to her four grandchildren. Uh, which may be a task that can be quite difficult. I don't know. Better, better the piano than a violin, I would say. So at this point, we will uh, thank Mariette for being willing to give us this marvelous presentation today, and we will turn the camera and the slide program over to her. Well, thank you, Robert, for that introduction. Um, <laughs> you know, when preparing this um, PowerPoint, as you can imagine, it brought back a lot of childhood memories for me. <laughs> and sometimes, as I am now, because I'm nervous right now, but I will settle down, um, it's hard for me to talk about the closeness of my father. So please excuse me. <laughs> So who was my father? He was a thinker. He was interested in spiritual things. And from an early age, he had a charisma about him and a presence about him that attracted people to his happy disposition. He became a high school um, prefect. Here's a lovely photograph taken of him. He was enthusiastic about obtaining a profession as a young man and he was also enthusiastic about finding a purpose in his life. He was actually a pretty ordinary man who became, I think, a little bit extraordinary because of his life of service. He was born in Quorn. South Australia, you'll see the map of Australia there. And if you look at the map on the right hand side, in the middle of the page, right at the top of the of the ocean there, you will see a little place called Corn. He subsequently moved down to Port Wakefield, which was due south, you will see, and then later on into Adelaide. His father was employed by the railways and initially as a porter and he finally became a station manager and then transferred down to Adelaide. Growing up, a photograph of my father and his parents. And this is a photograph of him as a student and with his dog, Bob. Now, this dog, Bob, was actually instrumental um, to my father, thinking about spiritual things a little more deeply as he went into his higher teens. He was always puzzled about the resurrection of Jesus. And when Bob died, he was buried at the back of their property and subsequently, years later, the fence at the back of the property needed to be replaced and he was asked to dig up the posts and put the new ones in. When he did that, he discovered the bones of Bob and that made him think 
that maybe the resurrection of Jesus was not a physical resurrection. It was more a spiritual resurrection. But the churches had confused him at the time, thinking that it was a physical resurrection. My father eventually moved to Adelaide and uh, got employment. And every Sunday he would go to a different church. He would sometimes go to three churches on a Sunday. And he went to a Unitarian church. And for the first time, he heard the minister there talk about other religions, other great religions. And this sermon inspired him. And so he went to the public library and he started to read books on other religions. And so this actually was the beginning of his spiritual journey. He was studying accounting at night school and he worked in an office during the day. In 1932, he worked for a large engineering company and he learned to do fitting, turning and die making, specialising in metal die construction and design and in the mass production of components. This experience enabled him to set up a precision engineering partnership and factory making pressed metal parts in 1938. And he was it went into partnership with a Mr. Voigt and um, he remained in that business for 35 years, eventually becoming the sole owner because he bought over the partnership when Mr. Voigt passed away, retired. He became recognised in the industry for his excellent workmanship, for his fairness and integrity in the conduct of his business. Now here's his business, F and V Best Metal Company, F for Featherstone, of course, and V for Voigt. And that was how it looked until 1966 when he decided to give it a bit of a makeover and um, put a new facade in the front. This is a photograph taken inside the factory with his factory manager on the right hand side and a sales rep on the left. And then the photograph on the right is my father there and with a press operator with my mother and my sister. So there were many press machines in this factory. Um, and you can imagine that you walked in there and it was like all oh, hell look, took, uh, took place. <laughs> Because each machine was going clonk, 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 cuck, 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 bop, 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 bop. And when you put about a dozen or more of these machines together, that's why my father had a very strong voice, because he had to speak very loudly in this environment. So while all this was happening, of course, he met his sweetheart, my mother, and that was their engagement photograph on the right. And she was a nursing sister in the hospital in Wyala, and he often used to go visit her about 200 miles north of Adelaide. Then eventually, 1938, were married. Look at that wedding dress very carefully because you'll see it later. He joined as a community service, he joined the Bush Nursing Service, which is like the ambulance service today. 1939, um, moved into this house and this is where they began their family life and had four girls in this house. Here's my mother with the first three children my elder sister on the right. Then one day, these two beautiful ladies who were Baha'is 
went teaching on a teaching walk. They'd been walking for hours. They were tired, exhausted, and they rested against the post of a railway line. And they called on the greatest name to attract a family in the area to the faith because they wanted to open up that new area in one of the suburbs of Adelaide. Sometime later, my mother was invited to a fireside at the neighbour's house. And this lady, Bertha Dobbins, was the speaker. She was a school teacher at the time. And my mother went along because she was told she could bring the children. So all the children went along too, the three children. And this lady opened the meeting with a prayer, the Baha'i prayer. Can you guess what it was? Yep, it was the Tablet of Ahmad. So that was her <laughs> introduction to the faith. She brought home a pamphlet and told my father that she'd heard about a new religion that was to embrace all the people of the world. And so my father said, oh, well, that sounds interesting. Can you get something to read besides this little brochure? It's not enough. So she said, OK, um, I'll, um, I'll get one next time. Well, next time she did, she got a book, a lovely big book, and guess what it was? Can you guess? The Dawnbreakers. Remember, this is 1944, okay? Not many Baha'i books available. And just at the uh, height of the Second World War. So my father, being an avid reader, which he was, he would often sit up at night time. Um, till the early hours of the morning reading. And he got into this book straight away. He got to the message of the Barb's address to the Letters of the Living, and when he read this, he said it was like a bolt. He realised that his faith was a faith from God and it was something that he wanted to know more about. So all this was at, as I said, the height of the Second World War with all its horrors. The business was struggling at this time. The tax man was waiting for his back taxes. Food was rationed. The back garden was used to grow the vegetables. There was no family car, no telephone. The milk and the bread were delivered by horse and cart. And the horse, of course, providing much needed fertiliser for the family garden. If the family wanted to go out, it was a bicycle ride and seats were put on the bicycle to allow the three children to sit on the bicycles. It was a walk to the shops or you catch a bus or a train. So December... This is the scene in December 44, when my parents decided to embrace the faith. This is a photograph taken of my parents and Bertha. And as you know, Bertha later, Night of Baha'u'llah to Vanuatu, Port Vila in Vanuatu, which was called the New Hebrides at that time. Bertha and her husband, Joe, were very instrumental in deepening my parents in the faith. And they held regular firesides even before they became Baha'is. Meantime, in 1946, Okay, okay, this is a photograph of Mother Dunn. Together with Bertha, Mother Dunn also came into our, our lives 
immediately after, uh, before my parents, no, immediately after my parents became Baha'is actually, a couple of months afterwards, she came and stayed and she was also very instrumental in um, providing a lot of deepening and encouraging um, to my parents as they grew into the Baha'i faith. Then as time went by, family increased again and they got another daughter and of course that was me. So I'm the fourth daughter. There's another photograph of us, me holding my little dolly there. A few months after becoming Baha'is, my father writes to the beloved guardian, Shoghi Fendi. He had 13 questions that he couldn't get answered. And as the Baha'is did in those days, and they were encouraged to, write to Shoghi Fendi. So he wrote off to Shoghi Fendi asking these questions. He got a wonderful reply back through the secretary, who happened to be Rahia Kanu. She wrote a lovely reply back and she says, Guardian hoped you, your wife, and the other young people who are so active in the cause in your neighbourhood will render it many services, promote unity and love in the community, strengthen the administrative foundations of the faith and attract many new souls to it. Then at the end of the letter, as Shoghi Effendi often did, he wrote his little personal um, saying, may the spirit of Baha'u'llah bless and reinforce your efforts and may he aid you to obtain a clearer understanding of the essentials of his faith and to advance its best interests and contribute to the consolidation of its God-given institutions. So my parents were spurred on by enthusiasm, support, encouraged to be bold. They were encouraged to travel and to teach, to attend the Baha'i Summer School. And this they did, their very first summer school, very shortly after they'd become Baha'is in 1946-47, just after I was born. They were encouraged to build a community in the area where they lived to get a group and then eventually to establish a local spiritual assembly. They actually did all that. And the the first local spiritual assembly was formed in, in 1948. And this is a photograph of Mother Dunn. Um, this is um, Mariette Bolton. There's my, my father sitting here. Um, this is Mother Dunn opening the a celebration which was held in the local town hall to which a whole pile of dignitaries had been invited. So the family's growing up. Mother Dunn visits us regularly. I have a lot of beautiful stories to tell about Mother Dunn. There I am sitting on her lap. And you know, Mother Dunn, Clara Dunn, she and her, for those of you who are not aware, she and her husband were the pioneers to Australia um, back in 1920 at the uh, call of Abdul Baha in the Tablets of the Divine Plan. Mother was subsequently appointed a hand of the cause in 1951 and her husband posthumously 1952. Father Dunn, passed away in 1941. So as a family, we never knew him. My parents didn't become Baha'is until 44, so they did not know him. We only knew Mother Dunn. So my parents were on the first local spiritual assembly of Woodville. And in a couple of years, my father was a delegate to the National Convention in 1949. 
You know, he was a man who got things done. When Baha'i books were unobtainable, he decided because, you know, postage wasn't so easy in those days. Uh, receiving books was not so easy. They were not freely available. He decided to obtain a license and he bought many books of his own um, from the United States. Later, when the government experienced difficulty with the balance of payments, it only allowed an import quota to those who'd purchased books in the previous year. As the National Assembly needed to buy books and could not get an import license, my father allowed the National Assembly to use his quota. And that's how the National Assembly um, at that particular time were able to get their books uh, available for the rest of the Baha'is in, in Australia. He did a public, uh, a public speaking course because he was being called upon to give talks at firesides and public meetings and he needed to find out how to do that properly. You know, he was a cigarette smoker, but when that got in the way of the fast, he decided, well, he's got to give that up. He then decided that he wanted to take photographs because he understood the importance of the Baha'i faith at that time, especially making history. And so he wanted to record all of these important events that were occurring. And so he took a course in photography. Remember that wedding dress I told you, my mother's wedding dress? Well, they did their community service too. And they supported immigrants um, who were coming into Australia and offered them hospitality. And this lady, her name was Anne, and his name was George, had come from Europe and they had no family here in Australia. And so my, my parents offered them friendship and my mother offered Anne her wedding dress and they were married and I'm the little flower girl on the right hand side and my mother made our dresses for us. Then there was another couple on the right hand side that my parents also befriended and assisted them with their marriage plans. And then along comes the 10 year crusade. Well, one thing I forgot to tell you, my father went to the National Assembly a convention in 1949 as a delegate. He actually then was elected onto the National Assembly and he remained on the National Assembly until 1962, often as, his, often as its chairman. So in 1953, at the beginning of the 10 year crusade, my father was on the National Spiritual Assembly of Australia. At the beginning of the crusade, there were 12 National Spiritual Assemblies around the world. Shoghi Effendi wanted that to be increased. And Hence the goals of the 10-year crusade to open up the world virtually to the faith. He wanted a marked increase and to begin the 10-year crusade, he called for a series of five intercontinental conferences and one was held in New Delhi. And my parents, together with about 20 Australian Baha'is, decided that they would attend that New Delhi conference. After that conference, my parents went on, applied for pilgrimage, which Shoghi Effendi had granted them. And they did their nine day pilgrimage. And of course, they had the honor of meeting Shoghi Effendi in 1953. Both of these experiences really confirmed their love and unity of the faith. 
and steered them to even greater heights of service. They were already busy, but they became busier. If there's time later, as a result of that pilgrimage and a result of my parents meeting Shoghi Effendi, I will show you a gift that Shoghi Effendi gave me if there's time. So my parents were spurred on. All they wanted to do was to make Shoghi Effendi happy. 53, our family decided the Woodville Local Spiritual Assembly was up and running. They decided to move to another area to open the local assembly there. And so we moved. No, before we do that, before we do that, uh, let me just go. Oh, after coming back from pilgrimage, we went off to Yerimbor. They hired a caravan. That was our car. That's my mother standing there. And the family, we all went off to Yerimbal Summer School, which is a long way from Adelaide. It's about a, a thousand miles from Adelaide. So it was a long car ride in the caravan. We had a wonderful time. I remember that as a little kid. I was six, six or seven at this age. Then after coming home from Yerimbal, beginning of 53, my parents, 54, my parents moved to Port Adelaide and this is our house there and the local assembly of Port Adelaide was then formed and then in 1954 another child came along and that was my brother and there we are as a young family in that house. 1954 also the beloved guardian called for a new institution, the institution of the auxiliary boards. All the hands of the cause around the world were to appoint auxiliary boards to assist them with their teaching work of protection and propagation of the faith. By this time, our own hand of the cause, Mother Dunn, is 84 years of age. She's getting on. And of course she needed help. So she appointed her two auxiliary boards, my father as one and dear Thelma Perks as the other. So right from the beginning, these two began traveling on behalf of mother because she was too frail to travel into the virgin areas that Australia opened um, as the goals of the 10-year crusade expanded. This was their territory, Australia and the Pacific. And when you look at that area, it's a huge area. All of those islands had to be open to the faith. And they were during the 10-year crusade, one by one. Do you know in 1953, when the 10-year crusade was um, established and the goals established, five of the National Spiritual Assembly members of, National, of the National Assembly of Australia pioneered into this Pacific area. They had to do a complete revote. <laughs> the National Assembly uh, lost five of its members, which was a huge, a huge feat. So my father visited Papua New Guinea in 1954, then to the Solomon Islands. And at that time too, Mother Dunn came and visited us and he made a tape recording of her, giving her account of her meeting Abdu'l-Bahá in San Francisco. And we have that. The House of Justice has that tape today. Beautiful story of how Mother Dunn um, met uh, Hyde Dunn and then subsequently Abdul Baha in San Francisco and then pioneered to Australia. At 
the beginning of the 10-year crusade, the National Assembly of Australia set up the Asian Teaching Committee. And this was to support all these pioneers that were now going out into the Pacific. You know, they were cut off. They could only receive mail maybe once a month. And there was nobody else around them. The teaching work was in their hands. And they relied on the Asian Teaching Committee to keep them informed of one another and of the messages coming from Shoki Effendi. And my parents were members of the Asian Teaching Committee, my father as secretary. So by 1954, my parents are very busy. They have five children. My father is on the National Spiritual Assembly, as well as being an auxiliary board member. And now he's secretary of the Asian Teaching Committee. And he runs an engineering business. The Asian Teaching Committee set up a newsletter which was called the Koala News. And I have a copy of it. all the volumes of the Koala News here. These were typed out onto, can you see it? If I put it up. These were typed out on Romeo as they were in those days, gestetted off. And I remember as a child, um, collating them and stapling them, putting them in envelopes and sending them off to the pioneers in the Pacific. My parents often used to stay up late at night because when an important message cable came through from Shogi Fendi, they would get it off to the pioneers in the Pacific immediately. And all of these pioneers in the Pacific would write in to the Asian Teaching Committee. And so the correspondence started to pile up. In 1955, beloved guardian advised my father to attach the utmost importance to the incorporation of local spiritual assemblies. So of course, with determination, he pursued this task. Whatever the goals of the 10 year crusade, he was systematic, and relentless in his pursuit of them. As a national assembly member, he also assisted in obtaining recognition of Baha'i marriage. And then of course, in 1957, the beloved guardian appointed the last contingent of hands of the cause. My father was in his factory when he received a phone call from the Secretary of the National Assembly in Sydney and said to him, Collis, are you sitting down? I have a cable from Shogi Fendi. He said, well, I'm not, but uh, yes, I am now. He says, okay. And he read his cable. Announce your elevation, rank, hand, cause, confident, new honour will enable you rise greater height service, beloved faith, Shogi. Well, if you had received that cable, what would have you done? My father doesn't remember what he did. <laughs> he doesn't remember if he, if he put the telephone down or what he did. But he left the factory and he went and sat in his car in the garage. He was shaking. He had to collect himself. He thought, my goodness, can't be right. He went back into the factory and he told his manager that he wasn't feeling very well and he was going home. So he, of course, went home, collected himself. 
of course, told my mother. And then he replied to um, Gable. Overwhelmed appointment, assure you my loving devotion, humbly seek your prayers, fulfillment functions, high station, constant stuff. And then the guardian responded, confident new honour, enable you attain greater height service, Shogi. When I came home from school that day, I remember I was 11 at the time. My mother said important news has come through from Shogi Effendi. We're going to visit Mother Dunn. She happened to be in Adelaide at that time, which was absolutely wonderful. And she was staying with a Baha'i family. And so she said, we're going to eat dinner quickly and, and go. So we prepared ourselves as a family. We went and visited Mother. And my father, of course, told her the news. And she was over the moon. <laughs> she was so happy that my father had been appointed a hand. They were very, very close, very close. They just loved one another dearly. It was a beautiful photograph of my father and mother. If you look carefully at the shawl that mother is carrying, she knitted those and that's her knitting basket. And she gave me one of those shawls, I have it. Well, of course, my father was stunned. He didn't feel, of course, that he was worthy. But when you read what Baha'u'llah says about the hands of the cause, it made him tremble. He thought, how can I ever measure, measure up to what Baha'u'llah wants as a hand? But he had to put his foot forward. And as Shogi Effendi encouraged, Put your foot forward and you'll be able to do it. And as we know, one month later, what happened? Shogi Fendi passes away. And there's the funeral. And of course, he's buried in the cemetery in London. The hands of the cause were devastated, especially those that had recently been appointed because they thought, where is the direction now? As you know, the Hands of the Cause immediately met in Haifa in November of 1957, as they had to assume their role as the custodians of the Baha'i Faith. And I won't go into that story because it's another very big story for another time. At that time, he made a 16 millimeter film. He was quite a photographer by, by now and he had a movie camera and he took a film of the hands. And that film, if you remember, there was a a DVD made of the hands. It was sent to Haifa, the, the House of Justice have it, and um, it was used in that DVD. That was all the footage that my father took at that time. There were very few other photographs of the hands in Haifa. You know, of course, they met every year from 1957 until 63 when the House of Justice came into being. Um, and he took photographs every year of the hands. This is one of those photographs taken in 1957. Not all the hands are there. So my father had to rearrange his life. He had to rearrange the management in his business so that he could be more available to fulfill his functions as a hand. He had a 
he had to maintain a growing com correspondence with his auxiliary boards. He had to attend National Spiritual Assembly meetings. He was still secretary of the Asian Teaching Committee and the production of the Koala News. He was also the member of a local spiritual assembly in Port Adelaide where they lived. And he had five children. So was he busy? Yes, he was busy. In 7.58, we went back to Erinbal. And there we are with Mother. It's a beautiful photograph taken here. There I am, the little girl, down the bottom on the right, with Mother Dunn. And some of you will recognise on her right is Dr Peter Kahn, former member of the Universal House of Justice, who's now passed on. Immediately behind Mother, the three girls, they're my sisters, all now growing up. So that's a beautiful photograph of Mother with us all. By this time, she's 88. In 1958, Intercontinental Conference in Sydney. This is the photograph taken and I'm in there somewhere. Five Hands of the Cause visited us on that occasion. And if you look very carefully in the middle, you will see Dear Mother on, on her, on the right of Mother is Dr. Kardem. On the left of Mother is Agnes Alexander, then Mason Remy, then my father. That's one, two, three, four, five. Five hands were at that conference. Following that conference was the foundation ceremony at the House of Worship. And Mother Dunn was asked, requested by the beloved guardian, to place the sacred earth from the most holy shrine and plaster from the castle of Marku in the foundation of the house of worship. I have a recording of mother saying a prayer on that occasion, her favorite prayer. In the Christmas holidays following this conference, so it was 58, 59, my father would always go traveling at, on our Christmas holiday time, which was our summer time. He visited the, the Maoris of New Zealand for the first time. In 1961, moving along now, he took the place of Hand of the Cause John Robarts, who had fallen ill, and he took an extensive trip through Central America. Up until 1963, he travelled extensively. He made 29 visits to 14 countries in Australasia and Asia. He travelled to nine European countries and five in Central America. He visited the Holy Land six times. In 1961, he visited the most great house of Baha'u'llah in Baghdad. My mother was with him and the most holy spot in the Garden of Rizvan. Family is now growing up. Here's a lovely photograph taken. My father actually took this on a, what do you call it, on a, Uh, with a camera stand and we had to smile when the light went off. Here's another one, the family getting older. We didn't have too many family photographs after this because my elder sister left home. She went pioneering to Western Australia, to Perth, to open up the local assembly there. And then my other sister right on the left, she, she got married. So in 1962, my father, uh, as all the hands did, resigned from the Nats because some of the hands were members of National Spiritual Assemblies at the time. And they all resigned as members of the National Spiritual Assembly um, to make way for the Universal House of Justice in 1963. 
and to also concentrate more on their role as a hand. This is a photograph of the hands of the cause together with the House of Justice in 1963 in Haifa, following the uh, election of the House of Justice. From 1963 to 1968, the auxiliary boards increased from four to nine and Collis's territory expanded to include Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia. He made 66 visits to 42 countries in every continent. So he did a lot of traveling. This was the area, North and Southeast Asia. So Australia's big, the Pacific, and then he had to extend all the way up through Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, all of those countries up there, up to Japan, Korea. In 1968, House of Justice called for Continental Boards of Councillors. You know the hands? A lot of them were becoming frail and they weren't going to be around forever and ever. And the Board of Councillors was established and these were the first three members of the Continental Board of Councillors for Australasia. Suhala Lay from Samoa on the left, Thelma Perks who was former Auxiliary Board member, uh, Howard Harwood who was also former Auxiliary Board member from Adelaide. 68 to 76, my father made 126 visits to 49 countries in all but one continent of the globe. He attended three of the eight oceanic and continental conferences, Singapore, Suva, Sapporo in 1971. He was present at the International Teaching Conference in Anchorage and Paris in 76. In 1977, or in 1976, the House of Justice asked my father to make himself totally free for travel, which meant he had to get rid of his engineering business. So it was sold. They moved from Adelaide north to Queensland to a place called Rockhampton. And if you look on the map in the middle of Queensland, it's about in the middle. It's about 600 kilometres north of Brisbane. Moved to this house in Rockhampton. They set up office there. And of course, after leaving his factory, he had to have a little workshop. So all the important things, little tools and things that he had, he brought them with him, made a little workshop at home because he always liked to tinker in his workshop and they purchased a caravan, which they used to travel around Australia when they were not, when they were not traveling overseas. This is his office, his desk with his typewriter, his correspondence, his filing cabinets, how many filing cabinets, his bookshelves, bookshelves after bookshelves. And if you look carefully on the right-hand side, you will see bound volumes. You know, he used to collect all the stars of the West, the Koala News, the Australian Bulletin, so many other things. And as I said to you earlier, if there was something he wanted to learn, he would go and learn it. So he went to TAFE and did a binding course and he learned how to bind, bind books. And then he would put all of his newsletters together and bind them up. Some of his correspondence, he would put them all and bind them up. And that's how he kept all of his things in order. In 
He also collected photographs. He had huge photograph albums. We sent so many of them off to the House of Justice when he passed away. There was always family time. And children came along. And these are a couple of photographs with my parents, with us as our family grew. So on the left hand side, my first daughter, and then on the right hand side with our three, when they visited us in Papua New Guinea. We were living in Papua New Guinea at that time. You know, the believers were always overjoyed to meet him when he visited their countries. He inspired them. He gave stories. He gave talks on the covenant, which was his favourite, the will and testament of Abdu Baha. He knew backwards. He used charts to explain what he was wanted them to understand. He was always encouraging, smiling, happy, laughing, sometimes joking, bringing news, always listening to their tales and their woes. Oh, here he is with some family members. The one on the right, he's with my, my daughter and with a little baby goat in a park that we visited. Here he is with his charts. He was a chart on progressive revelation, which he had. Here's another chart explaining the, the line, Ba Baha'u'llah Abdul Baha, and then hands of the cause, and then the elected arm and the um, spiritual arm, appointed arm. You know, when he traveled, he met with everybody. He met with dignitaries, government officials, prime ministers, <laughs> newspapers, radio, television. With the indigenous believers, he went into their villages. He slept in their huts. He went. To the, he and, uh, opened their Baha'i centers. He always inspired them. And when you travel around and you find a little child called Colissi, then you know that Collis had been there and a child had been named in his honour. He walked over mountains. He rode in every type of vehicle, canoe, plane, boat, motorcycle, everything you can think of. Another chart explaining the ark, the buildings coming up in the ark. And here's the one on progressive revelation. This one was taken in Vanuatu in 1984. You know, in the 80s, he was in his 70s already. And his health started to fail him. He had two heart attacks. We thought we'd lost him at one stage. But obviously, Baha'u'llah decided that he had a little bit of oomph in him yet and gave him a few more years. His last trip he made in September 1990, which started in Fiji, then back to Australia to connect a connection to Bangkok, where he stayed with a Baha'i family, and then on to Kathmandu in Nepal. He met with the National Spiritual Assembly there. He met with the community, the Baha'i community one night, and then he took ill and went into hospital. He was in hospital a couple of days. He had a heart attack and then passed away. During the 36 years of his international travels, my father visited 529 visits to 108 countries. One year he won the Australian Award for the most travelled person. And he got he got a prize for that. No wonder because he was travelling so much. 
He travelled in continents throughout Asia and the Pacific Islands. He also visited all parts of Australia by car and caravan. He represented the House of Justice at conferences, conventions, national spiritual assemblies. But finally, in Kathmandu, Nepal, he passed away. That is where he's buried today. That is what it looks like today. This is a photograph taken a little bit earlier in his life. That's the cemetery today. We were invited to go to the 25th anniversary of the passing of my father in 2015 uh, by the National Spiritual Assembly of Nepal and my sister, one of my sisters and her husband and daughter and my husband and I went, and there's my husband and I at the time of that 25th anniversary. They gave a one-day program, National Assembly put on a one-day program for the Baha'is in that area. And we, we met some of the local believers um, who knew my father from that time. This is a photograph taken at the time of his burial. That's what the area looked like. And from the same point, that's what it looks like today. So at that time, back in 1990, that whole area had not been opened up. But now within that 25 years, the whole area had been built up and surrounded by local houses. It was, it was a very interesting funeral because we had to walk down these very rugged mountain to get to the Baha'i property, which was the cemetery. If you look in, right on your left, you'll see a lady walking down there. There happens to be Judy Hassel, member of the National Spiritual Assembly of Australia at the time, who represented Australia at that funeral. Now, after this passing of my father, Riha Khanum, the wife of Shogi Fendi, wrote to my mother and she said, when I think of my colleagues, my fellow hands who circled the globe in his service, I think how appropriate that their resting places too are scattered around the globe. Those spots are special points of attraction and stimulation to the efforts of the friends, like precious sparkling gems that are pinpoints of light across a darkened planet. And many of the hands are not buried in their hometown. Many of, many of them are buried in different places. This was the message given by the House of Justice at the time of his passing. Deeply grieved, announced passing valiant hand cause, Collis Featherstone, while visiting Kathmandu, Nepal, course extensive journey, Asia. His notable accomplishments as staunch, fearless defender of the covenant that he was. His unceasing commitment, propagation cause, all parts, especially Pacific region. His unremitting perseverance, fostering establishment, local national institutions, administrative order. His exemplary devotion to writings faith. His outstanding personal qualities, unswerving loyalty, enthusiasm, zeal and dedication distinguish his manifold services throughout many decades. Now, my, my mother passed away in 2009. 
19 years after my father. And this was a family get together. Well, at the time of her funeral, actually. And then we, we came together and we had this photograph taken. And we sent it to the National Assembly of Nepal. It's very, <laughs> very hard for me to read this. We, the family of Mr. Featherstone, thank you more than you can ever imagine for holding in trust the special remains our dear and loving father father-in-law grandfather and grandfather sorry So that's the story of my father. Together, 50 other hands, 50 hands all together, appointed by four by Baha'u'llah, four by Abdul Baha, and 42 by Shoghi Fendi. I guess it's an era that will never be surpassed in the future. It will go, go down in history as these were the apostles of God. And each one of these hands has this story. Each one of them is a story of sacrifice. <laughs> There are many beautiful books available on these hands. And I'm sure those who are not accounted for will be accounted for in the future. And generations into the future will read about them, read about their lives. You know, I was only thinking if only we knew the intimate stories of the 18 letters of the living, a couple we know, but most of them, we don't know their stories. We don't know their families. We don't know that intimacy about them. We know how they dedicated their lives. But we don't know a lot more about those early 18 letters of the living. And so that's actually one reason why I decided to give this story on my father, so that the friends have it. It's available. It's an intimate look into his personal life. And I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mariette, it was an extremely moving presentation, a very, really intimate portrayal of your father, um, very precious memories and we're very very grateful that you've taken this time put it together and offered it to us so thank you very very much for this and i'm sure thousands of people will watch this in the future and get great inspiration from it i suppose if i have any question I don't know how I'll actually even answer the question, ask the question, how did he do it? Is there an answer <laughs> to that question, do you think? Even before he was a, you know, even before he was a hand, he, he did so much. I how think, did he do I it? Think, I think that Baha'u'llah gave him energy. He was strong. He, not only physical energy, he had spiritual foresight and as soon as he embraced the faith, he embraced it wholeheartedly. And I think that Shoghi Effendi really encouraged him in those early days. You mentioned 
how much after the pilgrimage he came home wanting to, I, I think you said to make Yogi Fendi happy. And we've heard that theme in other situations as well. When people understood, people who knew him knew how much he suffered for the faith. Many people felt an urge to make him happy, to give him joy in his his life and, and this enormous stress that probably took his life in 1957. You're absolutely right. You know, I was only just reading the very early copies of, you know, I remember I told you of the... Um, koala. The Koala News. And this yeah. started in 1954. May 54 was the first edition. And right from here are the messages from Shoghi Effendi to the uh, pioneers out into the Pacific area and to Australia. And, you know, the way Shoghi Effendi writes and spurs them on is just incredible. It's no wonder that they were... They really wanted to make him happy because he he it was like he was personally addressing them all, personally writing to them all, and he constantly did it to spur them on, and he achieved that, and they responded to that, and that happened around the globe, obviously. Because, as I said, at the beginning of the 10-year crusade, there were 12 national spiritual assemblies. At the end of that 10-year period, there were 56. Look at that huge yep. growth in that 10 years. It was exponential. And already by 1957, at the passing of Shoghi Effendi, he was known to have said that he was more than happy with the progress of the 10-year crusade. He never expected that it would be, it would go as well as it did all around the world. Especially when you look at the previous decades where there was such an incredible struggle to establish assemblies in the 20s and then along came the Nazis and along came the Soviets and along came the persecution in Iraq and the persecution in Iran and the number of functioning national assemblies dropped. And then the Second Crazy. World War, which, you sure. know, it put everything to a stop virtually. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yep. We have a few questions. And uh, now I have to move my cursor here because the first question, Boyd himself asked this question for you. As a business owner, how did the fact that Collis owned a business affect his service to the faith? Was it a hard balance between family, business, and service to the faith? Was it hard for him to sell his business? It was hard for him to sell his business, absolutely. You know, he'd been there for, what, 30-something years. He had seen it grow, you know. He took over the partnership. Mr. Voigt, his partner, virtually assisted in training him. He was a very good man. And I remember, I remember as a child, Mr. Voigt. And um, then when he retired, of course, my father brought over the partnership and he uh, and the manager stayed on. He had his the manager um, all along. He didn't want to lose him because he relied on him. And um, when he became a hand and knew that he had to travel even more, he um, upped his salary and upped his this and upped his that to make him happy so that he could um, virtually take over the whole business and run it. But, you know, there was an interesting story I remember my father telling us that he used to get these, um, he used to have to apply for the contract to do jobs, you know. And when this particular job came in, he didn't want it. And he thought, oh, if I get this job, 
I would have to buy new, 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 new equipment, new machinery. I have to get it from Germany, and that's going to be such a problem. No, I, I don't. I don't think I want this job. So what he did was, he tripled the price. If if they want me to do it, well, I'm just going to put a huge price on it so they don't give it to me, so that he would lose the quote. But you know what? He got it. He got it. <laughs> And he thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do? So he just had to put it into action. He had to get this new equipment in from Germany. And the, the, the new manager just had, I mean, the manager just had to, to show his worth. And often when he was traveling, he would often write to my mother, how is the business going? My mother would have to send him reports. How is this going? How was that going? But, you know, in the end... At one particular time, he was worried about the finances. And he wrote to my mum, what's happening with this and this and this? My mother sent a reply, but he didn't get the reply until he got home. Oh. It had followed him all around the world from wherever he'd been to place to place. <laughs> and when he got home, everything was hunky-dory. He had nothing to worry about. So after that, he thought, okay, the Bahá'u'lláh. You've obviously got it sewn up. I'm going to leave it in your hands. <laughs> he didn't worry. But then he had to, eventually he sold the business. That's a great song. The factory actually yeah. is still there. I visited a couple Kim of years asked. ago and took the photograph. It looks exactly the same. Ah, and it's still working just fine, huh? Oh no, it's not. It's not now an engineering business. It's a air conditioning business. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, Kimberly has a question. Uh, let's see. Um, Connie Atkinson, thank you so much for sharing the gorgeous and inspiring story of your father, the hand of the cause, Collis Featherstone. We are so fortunate to have this record. And Sue Emil, who I guess they're all. Oh, I see. Boy, to put these together. Um, thank you for sharing these lovely recollections, Mariette. May we know the 13 questions that your father posed to Shogi Effendi? Oh, I, think would that, make a very I think that would take another, another session. <laughs> 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 that would take another session. <laughs> you said you had something you wanted to show everybody? You had time? As long as you've got time. I've got a story I can tell. Yeah, there's no there's no questions right now, and maybe we'll get another question. We may get some more questions, but go ahead. Okay. When my parents went on pilgrimage, I was seven, and my sisters and I we were all, we were all farmed out. I went to stay with my auntie. My other sisters went to stay with another auntie, and so on. And at that time, in the Baha'i community. I had a little autograph book. Can you see it? This is my little mm -hmm. autograph yeah. book. Yeah. And I would go around the Baha'i community and I'd get everybody to sign it. I've got some wonderful signatures in here, absolutely wonderful. Some gorgeous things which, which the early Baha'is have written in here. And I must just share one. This, this is just a funny one. This one says, if you can see it, can you see what it says? Can a little you read bit, that? but we can't read it. Um, For boys only. No, I don't think so. Oh. For boys only. Oh, yes, I see that. See that? For boys only. When you open up the flap, it says, little girls are nosy. <laughs> Can you see that? There's a little <laughs> flap. There's a little flap. A little so bit, I, yeah. Of course, when I when it's there for boys only, the first thing you want to do is look at it, right? So you open up the fact it says little girls are right. nosy. <laughs> anyway, that's a fun one. But <laughs> I've got one in here. Oh, oh, I'll find it in a minute. But anyway, I I hear. Guess who wrote this? To travel hopefully is a better thing than to arrive. And the true success mm. is to labor with deepest Baha'i love, Peter Kahn. Oh, nice. 1957. 
1957. Long time oh, ago. I was just a kid. He was oh, he was a young student at that time. Okay, so this autograph book I gave to my mother and father and I said, I want you to ask Shogi Fendi to sign it for me. I I badgered them so much that my mother said there was no way they could come home without having done it. So she took the autograph book one night to dinner and she said to Shogi Fendi that the youngest daughter had asked a special favour of Shogi Fendi, would he please sign the autograph book? The Shogi Fendi just took the book. The nine days went by and nothing was said. On the last oh. dinner, my mother was saying, oh, what about that autograph book? I wonder, has Shogi Fendi forgotten? Should I remind him? What, what should I do? How can I go home without that autograph book? My daughter's going to kill me. <laughs> Finally, Shogi Fendi says, you know, you asked me to sign the autograph book for your daughter. He says, I decided that I would give her something more precious. And he handed her a photograph huh. of a hidden word written by Abdul Baha. And it's the hidden word which some of you may recognize. Have ye forgot oh, my friends, have ye forgotten that true and radiant morn? When in those hallowed and blessed surroundings, you were all gathered in my presence beneath the shade of the tree of life. And so it goes on. That was the hidden word. And my mother put it together in this leather folder. And this is the photograph that I received from Shogi Fendi. So this is my personal gift from Shogi Fendi. Huh, fantastic. Mm. Yeah. How very, very precious. Yes. How marvelous. Yes. Yeah, so got, that's my special story. <laughs> well, we've got some more questions, of course. Meanwhile, Paul uh, Mantle, who often is uh, uh, tuned in, says that when I saw your father in San Francisco around 1980, he was carrying a copy of the Will and Testament, Master's Will and Testament, in his briefcase. It appeared well used. And uh, yes, yeah. he had many copies of the will and testament, and many of them are underlined, written in the columns, written all over, depending on the nature of the talk. He had, I don't know how many copies of the will and testament, he had many copies, and he used to, yes, his favorite. Uh, he, he knew the will and testament backwards. Okay, yeah, the one, I have another question here. Well, one person asked us, asked about the, the gift, but uh, uh, let's see. Are you considering publishing the 13 questions uh, sometime? <laughs> People are interested in, oh, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I've got another story. In 1950, oh, okay. 1957, 1958, this was 1958. You know, when the hands of the cause met in Haifa each year, my father would take a stack of prayer books and one and, and pass them around the table and all the hands would sign them. And so he would come home with these prayer books which were signed by all the hands of the cause. And mm -hmm. From that little autograph book, I eventually upgraded to a bigger one. <laughs> so I gave him my autograph book and said, can you get them to sign my autograph book? So I now have 27, uh, I think 26 hands of the cause, all personally signed in my autograph book. Wow. Yeah, not Corinne True because she could. That's make right. It. I think it was Corinne True who couldn't make it to one of the. Corinne ones. True yeah. wasn't there in '58. Right. That's yeah, right. she was like 99 years old. Yes. Yes. So that's another something special. 
that we have a copy of their signatures. That included Mason Remy. Huh. Well, I'm not sure if we have any other questions. I think all of us are just so uh, floating from this marvelous presentation. It really has given us a marvelous glimpse into the life of your father and your family. And we're very grateful for that. What, tell us a little bit more about your mother. She must have been at, doing a lot of work at home. She must have been keeping everything together. <laughs> you know, Mother Dunn had a, a name for my mother. She called her the general. She was <laughs> organized. Um, she was very organized. So, so was my father, actually. And my father was a perfectionist. So was my mother. They did a job and they did it well. And they got it done quickly. They were very methodical, very clear thinking. My mother undoubtedly was the support of my father right from the get-go. Yeah. Um, she supported him tremendously. If it wasn't for her, he couldn't have done what he did. Um, when he, as, as his correspondence grew, she contributed hugely to the correspondence. She probably was the main typist in all of these koala news. She probably typed wow. all, all of this. Um, and even us girls, when we got older, on a weekend, I would take shorthand from my father and type back, type the letters back to try and help him get through his correspondence. Hmm. He, would, he would give me the simple ones. The hard ones he would keep, of course, for himself, but the simple ones he would give me. And I would, um, and my, my yeah. elder sisters would help too. Um, but yes, he, you know, he would come home from the factory, 5.30, six o'clock at night, we had dinner. Seven o'clock, he would listen to the news on the radio. And then after, when the TV came in late 50s, he would watch ABC News. And then by 7.30, he was at his desk doing correspondence till 10.30. And that happened every night of the week. Mm -hmm. wow. And sometimes all weekend. Um, he was, wow. he took sometimes months to organize his itinerary because in those days, visas and, you know, plane flights in, in the early days were very, very hard. And to coordinate one national assembly with another to get the flights in, and and to coordinate it all, he would often he would mostly be away three four months at a time, <laughs> especially in the latter part of his life, right. when he in in when in when he retired from his business, he would be away three four months at a time. He'd come back a month, prepare his itinerary get his correspondence done, and then he would be off again. Wow. He was often not home when we would go home. One year we went home from Papua New Guinea. We had a holiday at Christmas time. They were not there. He was traveling around somewhere. Um, I would have to book him about 18 months in advance in order to make sure that he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't book a, something at that time. He was never home for his birthday. May fifth huh. was his birthday, and um, so we we had a half huh. birthday. So we, we decided November the fifth we would have his birthday because normally November the fifth he was home. Um, huh. But early early um, May he was always at national assembly conventions. Sure around the world somewhere. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, yeah. one more question. I, I kind of hate to cut this off, but we probably should at some point. Uh, Paul also asks this question. Did your father ever express to you his reaction to Mason Remy's breaking of the covenant? I don't know that I remember anything specifically 
um, of my father talking about Mason Remy, but um, just totally that the hands of the cause at the time were very patient with him. Um, that several of the hands were appointed to to um, consult with him, to so that he would fully understand that Shoghi Effendi had not left a will and testament, that he understood the provisions in the will and testament of Abdul Baha, that it was absolutely clear and that the claims that he were making were, were preposterous. Um, and I think they waited a year, two years before they eventually um, they gave him time, but mm -hmm. he didn't respond. They realised he didn't <clears throat> respond. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then eventually yep. they had to make the cut. Yep. Mm -hmm. It was a very, very sad time, um, especially for Rihir Khanum and especially for those hands who were um, in living in the Holy Land at that time and had been working closely with him at that time. Very difficult. Yeah. Because, of course, he was a youth at the time that Rahir Khanum was a youth growing up in Canada. Yep. Yep. Well, I think we probably should wrap it up and... Uh, I want to thank you again, I think for my third or fourth time, and, and I can't thank you enough for this really, I'm sorry really. sorry for my emotional outbreak. <laughs> it just, whoo. To be expected. To be expected. And this is a very special topic for you. And we're very, very appreciative of the tears as well. Again, thank you so much. Uh, You're most welcome. We'll be eternally grateful. It's been my pleasure. <laughs>